So, I don't have any time to talk about good quality research. I'm going to assume that everybody is doing it. But anybody seen this, this picture before? <laughs> Thank you, Dushan. <laughs> we have an expression. We have, we have lots of expressions in English, just like you have in Serbian. Uh, we have an expression, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Now, I keep asking, what's a sow? Kermach. Uh, yes, there, there, there we go. There's the, there's, there's the one-eared cow. Which means that you can't make something wonderful from poor quality starting materials. And that's another way to say you can't make a good quality paper if you didn't do good quality experiments. Right. Either modalia. Right. Your research has to be good enough quality or the manuscript is not going to be accepted. And by good enough quality, I mean you have to have identified all of the factors that are going to have an impact on the research that you were doing to make sure that you have taken account of them to such an extent that your research is actually telling you the truth to answer the question that you have asked. But to be published in a good quality international journal it needs more than that. You need to identify an international relevance for your research. Because to publish your work in an international journal, the journal is going to want your paper to appeal to readers around the world. Not just readers from Serbia or the Western Balkans. So you've got to make sure that there's some aspect of your research that you can put into an international context to make it attractive to the editor of an international journal. Now, international journals will give you more impact. I'm going to give you a few words about uh, aspects of impact. You all know that journals have impact factors, and you can get the impact factor of all the journals through Cobson. And the higher you aim with the impact factors, the more difficult it is in general to get your manuscript accepted. And therefore, you need to be realistic in choosing the journal for publishing your first manuscript. And then you can gradually work your way up once you develop the skills to put together good quality manuscripts for the future. Now, something that's become much more readily available in the last 10 years or so are open access journals. Open access journals, by definition are going to have high impact, at least once they have established themselves as good quality journals, they're going to have higher impact than many other journals because, by definition, they are open. Anybody can access the papers which are published in those journals. So if you want to aim for a journal which has a relatively high impact factor, then some of the good quality open access journals might be suitable for you. But be very careful, because there are hundreds, and well, no, not hundreds, there are thousands of open impact journals. Many of them, a large proportion of them, are not good quality. They are happy to take your money, they're happy to print whatever you give them, without any effective refereeing process. So you need to be very careful about open access journals. So let's focus on how you should write a manuscript of your own for a good quality journal. And I'm going to start off with some general comments on what type of a manuscript you're going to write. Because there are, there are four types of paper that you could put together. And I've summarized the four here, and then I'll give a few more words about each of those in a few minutes' time. The, the traditional scientific paper would be based on a hypothesis that you're testing by doing a piece of research. And 
you will therefore set up a hypothesis and then test it. That is probably the most frequent type of paper that you will see in the literature. Then you have what is fairly, uh, fairly common in Serbia, with Serbian scientists, it's just a purely descriptive paper, describing the way things are. We've been to this reservoir in Vojvodina, and we've sampled all the crustaceans and mollusks or whatever we can find in it. So that's a descriptive piece of research. And the third one is a techniques or methods paper, which is describing a new way of measuring something. And finally, a review paper, which will describe and discuss what other people have been doing by putting together a lot of manuscripts, lots of publications, and then identifying the key points from each of them. So I'll go through each of those in turn with a bit more detail. For our hypothesis-based piece of uh, research publication, you need to have one or more hypotheses to be tested. You need to have clearly defined aims justifying why that research is needed. You need to design the research in a sufficiently good way to be able to test that hypothesis. And then you need to have results that match the aims and the interpretation will then give you the answer to whether the hypothesis is true or false. And I've put at the bottom there short communications. Short communications are worthwhile to consider for two reasons. One is that by their definition they are easier to write because they are, they are short. You don't have to write a lot. And the second reason is because they are short the publication time for them is usually a lot quicker than it is for a full paper. And if you read the uh, the definition of a short communication uh, by the ministry, you will find that the ministry will accept short communications as part of the evaluation process. So, short communications, for those journals that will accept them, that is uh, worthwhile for you to have a think about. Now, moving on to a purely descriptive paper, if you're going to be writing one of those, you need to have a clearly defined reason explaining why what you have done needed to be done. And also, what I've emphasized in that slide is that it needs to have international impact. So you may have been looking at a reservoir in Vojvodina, but for that piece of research to be accepted by an international journal, they need to know why it's important for you to be looking at a reservoir in Vojvodina. What is the international relevance for your findings? So you've got to make sure that you can put your research within an international context in terms of comparing that reservoir with other sites in other parts of Europe, for example, or testing it in comparison with water quality, or its association with human habitats, or farm pollution. You've got to be able to put your findings in some sort of context that will make it internationally relevant. So you would then uh, compare your findings in terms of implications for policy, uh, regulations and so on. The third type of publication, a, a methods paper. I've published two or three of those because over the years I have had to develop methods specifically to improve the effectiveness of the analytical methods that I was using for my research. So, if you're thinking of a techniques paper, you've got to justify why it's needed. So you've got to start by comparing the existing methods, identify the weaknesses of the existing methods, and then giving the description of your new method with sufficient detail 
So this is more detail than you would normally give in an ordinary scientific paper. You give more detail of the methods for others to be able to, to use it as a protocol. And then in the discussion, you would compare your new method with the existing methods to say how it's, uh, how it's better in some way. It's either quicker, it's more efficient, it's cheaper, the reagents uh, are less expensive and so on. So that's the third type of paper. And the fourth one, a review paper, this is something, how many of you, are there any still PhD students? One or two, a few of you PhD students. This is something that I would recommend that you have a look at. A review paper needs a clearly defined subject area that has not been reviewed recently. You compare the, the work of others, usually with your own findings. So if I'm writing a review paper, I will be looking at all the other publications in my subject area and compare them with my own work. I would include the latest research findings by contacting a few of my colleagues and asking them, have you got anything in press that I can refer to? And it's also at the bottom, it says it's an opportunity for you to publish research results that might otherwise not be possible to publish. Now, that doesn't mean to say that the quality of those results is poor, but the quantity of the results may not be sufficient for a, for a full paper. And I have done that myself. I have written a, re a review article where I'm able to include a graph or a table from some of my own research that is still in progress. So it's not yet sufficiently complete to make a full paper, but I can include some preliminary data from it as part of a, a review paper, which I'm comparing with other people's research results. And I, I asked how many of you are, are PhD students, because in the UK, PhD students have to include a general introductory chapter, which is reviewing the subject area for their thesis. So, if you are doing a general review of the subject area for your research that you're doing for your PhD, if you're already putting together a chapter for your thesis, which is a review of the subject, then it's worthwhile to discuss with your supervisor whether you could tidy it up, uh, get one or two of the key references that will be attractive to readers of a journal, and submit that as a review article. So that is a possibility that you might want to have a think about. Now, another aspect of a review article is that uh, by definition of a review article, it's going to be attractive to a large number of scientists. So that means that they will be journals that have a high impact factor. So you've got here examples of journals. I know you're not going to be publishing in Nature Reviews, Cancer, but okay. Um, but you may be uh, interested in review of economic studies or food science, advances in agronomy. Those journals in Cobson will all be M21. So that's another reason why thinking about a review paper is going to be 